Okay, can you all hear me? Brilliant. Okay, uh, let's rip straight into it, eh? Uh, here we go. Okay, so Wanganui District, um, we're a little wee sort of district on the, the west coast, the North Island there, um, sometimes known as the armpit of New Zealand because it's quite sort of temperate there. Um, and we have a, a sort of population of around about 48,000, so it's, it's sort of big enough that we can do things, but not too big that there, there's too much bureaucracy. Okay. Um, we're a very small GIS team. Um, Daryl Cooper's down the back there somewhere. He probably waved his hand. There he is. <laughs> Um, and sort of we have some quite distinct roles in what we do. So I look after administration, development, and we, we cross over in the data management side of things. And Daryl looks after sort of customer service, really, I guess, and looking after, you know, our, our internal and external clients. FOSS 4G is part of our strategy. It is actually in our GIS strategic plan, which probably needs an update, but anyway. Um, so, open source GIS. Um, why do we use open source GIS? Well, it it's, gives us flexible licensing. There's no vendor lock-in. Um, and we, you know, it's driven by a community worldwide. Um, we find that there's quicker innovation. Um, it's very reliable. Uh, and it, it conforms to open standards, which is always a good thing. Uh, and probably more importantly, um, if we are contributing into those open source projects, they, they are actually, you know, changes are actually strictly reviewed by the teams. Um, so there's not really, the, well, in, in the big projects anyway, there's no cowboys. Okay. Why wouldn't we use vendor GIS? Um, well, marketing departments have this funny way of determining the way forward with vendor-based GIS systems. Um, and they, they want you to do it a particular way, and that's not always what we want to do. Um, there can be very restrictive licensing. Uh, we find innovation is much slower when we were using proprietary GIS, uh, and bug fix is also much slower. Um, and the other interesting one is, is vendor standards aren't necessarily open standards. Okay. So that, that doesn't mean we're not licensed. Okay. Um, it does mean that we have a royalty-free use and reuse of the software. Um, and generally no license costs, uh, and obviously we have access to the source code. Um, so, yeah, the, you know, even though we are not paying a license fee every year, we are actually really still licensed for all, all these things. Okay, let's have a look at our stack, and we'll sort of have a, a bit of a before and after look. So, previously, we had some lovely things like uh, desktop with MapInfo Pro, which um, I sort of grew up on. I, I le started learning that in the early 90s. Um, we had some mobile stuff, uh, a, a viewer called Intramaps, which some of you all know in this room, uh, and we used Mango Maps a little bit, and we had this really awesome database called Windows File System. Had anybody had that database before? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank God we don't have that anymore. Um, okay, so we've moved on. We now have a very structured stack. You know, we, we know what we're using for our mobile stuff. We know what we're using for desktop. We've got an actual centralized database. Woohoo! That's awesome. We've gone with GeoServer as a, as a data-centric way of distributing that information out to some front ends for our, our internal and external clients, which generally tends to be through GeoNode or MapStore. Okay, we have a, a, a different way of looking at that previous stack. So I've split it out here into some sort of different categories that would, you would hope to have in your GIS stack at, at a local government level anyway. Okay, so our previous stack was, was fairly limited. We, we had some glaring um, sort of areas of that stack missing. Okay, moving on, our new stack. Okay, we've managed to fill that up and we've, we've actually got this huge capability for a very small council um, and all based on open source GIS technology. Okay. Um, one of the sort of things that came back from management when we sort of embarked on this journey was like, well, how mature are some of these open source projects? Well, as you can see from that, you know, they've, they've actually been around quite a long time. Um, there are actually significant contributors actually putting their development time into some of these projects. Comparative vendor solutions, yeah. Yeah, we could have gone down that uh, 
right hand side and you know, here's some money, have some money, Esri, come, come and get it. Um, but no, we're, we're quite happy with the way we've gone and it's seen some significant benefits to council over the last couple of years. Um, obviously cost savings. Um, we've actually had greater functionality than we've ever had. Um, we find that any new functionality coming on is actually driven by the community, the people that actually use those projects. That's fantastic, you know, it's, it means that you're actually getting uh, functionality in the product that you're actually going to use, not just some really fancy thing that the marketing department thinks is really whizzy. Okay. We haven't lost any of our integration capability with our other systems. Okay, so that's been pretty straightforward. Okay, let's take a closer look. Okay, so um, from a front-end point of view, this is our web mapping, which is based on Map Store. Um, so obviously that provides us with uh, straight web mapping capability. Uh, dashboards, you'll see there's a dashboard below there, which um, gives us indication of um, proposed subdivision activity within our, our district. Uh, and that's both charts, maps, and counters, and so on and so on. Um, and we also have the ability to do geo stories. Uh, Daryl's done a, a wonderful geo story there, which uh, documents all of the uh, artwork that are on the walls around um, uh, Wanganui uh, City. So uh, it's quite neat. You can flip through the little carousel at the bottom and actually find out where those bits of artwork are located. Uh, we've also got the capability of using Map Store as embedded maps within other parts of our website. Okay, so things like freedom camping areas, uh, you can do a cemetery search, and there's an embedded map in there. Um, we also have uh, integration with ePlan software from Isovist. Um, so our open source mapping capability is actually embedded in their uh, ePlan system. Uh, and then the, the bottom most picture there is, is our LiDAR viewer, which is based on Poetry. Okay, so we're actually displaying our LiDAR. You can do things like measure distances, measure heights, and do profiles, and God knows what else with Poetry. It's quite, quite cool. Uh, the other thing we have in our web mapping is some reporting capability. So as a, uh, you know, as a person out there, you, know, you sign in and you have a look at your house and you think, oh, okay, I need to really have a report on, on what that is actually on that property. One click, bang, you've got a PDF there with all the maps and all the data that you actually need um, for that property. Okay, um, web catalog. Um, we use GeoNode. Uh, we find that's a nice, simple interface, um, and it gives us um, s some way of uh, providing metadata to the end users and actually being able to download um, our data. Um, so pretty much 99% of our, our GIS data sets are actually available um, publicly. So we, we've sort of taken a, a, um, a sort of stance that most data we should actually make available to our our consumers. Right, with the web services. So this is really probably the part that's sort of core to being able to actually provide some of that uh, information out to uh, end users. And we've based it on GeoServer. And the main reason we use GeoServer over some other really, really good open source um, solutions was it had a data-centric approach. Right? And that means that um, you know, instead of there being a map-centric approach where if I had to change a label or something, I'd have to go through each individual map in the system and change it, I'm only changing it maybe in one or two style files in GeoServer. It's very data-centric. Our database. Um, so obviously we, we no longer really have the good old Windows file system anymore. We have this lovely database called Postgres and with the PostGIS extensions. And probably the biggest thing for us is that it gives us unsurpassed spatial functionality. I can, I can pre-process um, data actually in the database before it even hits any of those other systems. Um, the stored procedures um, set up in Postgres is unbelievable. Um, I can write a model in QGIS, call a stored procedure, it goes and does something and then spits it back to the model. And everything's happening at the database side. We use a bunch of tools for processing. Um, a lot of those are in automated uh, scripts. So we use GDAL, PDAL, uh, we use Valhalla as a routing service using OSM data. 
Um, so that enables us to automatically uh, consume data from the LINS data service. Um, we do aerial photo processing so that we can pr produce uh, cloud optimized geotiffs, um, those sorts of things. Um, QGIS, obviously, um, that is our, you know, for Daryl and I as GIS um, professionals, that is our desktop tool of choice. Um, we build processing models that simplify a whole bunch of our processes. Um, and we, we've never really had that capability before. Um, and of course, we use it for output. And uh, finally, the, the mobile side of things, we, we decided on QField as our, as our mobile open source uh, solution. Uh, that gives us simple field data collection. We can sync it back. We have our own uh, private QField cloud um, that we sync back to our, our systems with. And typically we use Android tablets, but we can also use Windows Surface and, and other things. Okay, so the future, where to next? Um, one of the things that we're really good at is consuming all of these lovely open source projects, but we haven't been very great at giving back to them. Right? So obviously we, we wanna be able to do more support for things like forums and maybe do some more documentation, uh, just help out in, in a lot more ways than we already are. And we wanna be more givers than takers. Uh, and on top of that, we, we want to share with local government, but they, they all haven't seen the light yet. They don't really understand that you can actually do stuff in an open source environment. So we're trying to preach that out there. <laughs> okay. Um, other projects that we're looking at, um, one of the projects I'm sort of keen on is actually building a 3D twin. We've got massive amounts of data. We've got LiDAR data. We've got all this lovely building outlines and things. Why can't I build a 3D twin using open source software? Well we're starting down that route. So hopefully hopefully next year, the year after, I might be able to do a presentation on a 3D twin done in open source. We'll see, we'll see. Okay. Right, now here's my just my rant. <laughs> uh, reflections on local government in New Zealand. So, so over 35 odd years of being in local government, you see things, you hear things, you, you think, my God, why did you do that? Um, and there's a couple of things that come through in there. Um, Changing from vendor A to vendor B will not fix your data issues. Have you all seen that before? It's like, yeah, we just changed this amazing piece of software and it's gonna fix everything. <laughs> no, no, it doesn't. <laughs> you actually have to spend some work on data. Um, so, um, One of the other things that's sort of strike, striking me is that I think there's a, quite a lot of vendor lock-in um, and that's, I believe, is dumbing down some of the GIS skills out there. Um, I don't know if you agree with that, that's just my opinion, but hey. Um, and I think innovation is, is actually decreasing in those sort of areas because you, the, these vendor orientated type GIS setups are just accepting the methodology of doing things as gospel. Okay, now one thing we really have learned, open source GIS, it does free up resources and it does allow us to improve our data and upskill our staff, okay? So that's one really awesome takeaway. Okay, and like it says there, all I did was give my opinion. Right. That's pretty much it. I'm open to questions. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Oh, there we go, we've got six minutes of questions. <laughs> Thanks very much for that, Simon. Um, just a, qu a quick one, I was hoping you could elaborate a little bit more on your reflections. Uh, so you mentioned uh, briefly about the challenges of getting other uh, uh, local governments to accept open source and, and work with them and understand that capability. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the challenges of getting uh, your council to actually accept open source and where there's, was there any hesitation from, uh, from the council and how do you deal with that? That's a great question. Um, essentially, when I was brought on board, it was all about cost saving. So we actually had to find the areas that we would save costs and with license. And actually, funny thing happened the other day, our 
our IT um, guy comes into the room and he's looking to save costs and he goes, oh, what licensing can we actually save costs on in, in the GIS area? Um, do you still have MapInfo and Intramax? And he goes, no, no. <laughs> It's all open source licensing. We can't actually cut any cost because there are none. <laughs> um, so uh, that would have been one of the initial things that actually drove the change. Having said that, we, you know, I, I arrived after Daryl. Daryl had already started down a track of using QGIS and starting to move that way anyway. We just, it just became a lot quicker. Hi, Simon, thanks for that. Um, just specifically about your key field data collection stuff, um, I'm trying to build yep. um, a, a similar uh, application, just having some bug issues. Are your configs open for people to have a look at, like a mature example of a, 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 a working field data collection that isn't having some of the bug issues that I'm having at the moment? Oh, that's a good question. Actually. Yeah. Um, I'm definitely open to providing those. Uh, they're not actually on our GitHub page at the moment, and, and be aware that we, Wanganui District Council has a GitHub page. Go to github.com, search for Wanganui District Council, you'll see our repositories there. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm more than open to um, providing, say, you know, our Docker configurations and things like that. Yep. Um, do you have an idea what the split is in, in local and regional government between, say, ESRI and QJS or other vendors currently? Oh yeah, um, yeah, so there is open source, and everybody else. <laughs> like percentage-wise, any, any idea? Um, well, literally, I think there's about three councils that are actually sort of on a stack similar to ours at this point in time. Everybody else is either uh, a hybrid environment where they'll use uh, a bunch of ESRI stuff and a, and a bunch of maybe QGIS and something else. Um, there's a handful of hexagon sites in New Zealand, I'm uh, I think there's maybe three of them. Um, but yeah, the, the vast majority seem to be uh, ESRI at this point in time. I've got a question about um, uh, field data collection. Sorry, that was a bit loud. <laughs> yep. Um, how tough was the choice of choosing an app? There's a few out there at the moment. We're, we're going through that at the moment. We want to decide which uh, field data collection app to use. There are some fantastic mobile open source project projects out there. Um, QField we just happened to choose because at the time that was the one we felt was, was really, really good. Um, but there's also Mergen and um, there's a couple of other ones as well. Um, and realistically, look, it's open source. Download the stuff, have a play, see what fits your particular environment the best. So is there anything about your district council that makes it possible to uptake the open source compared to other district councils? Or is this a decision or you have so many years in open source that you are able to do it, whereas other district council could not? Uh, I'm, I'm kind of lucky in that um, we have a, a, a great manager, um, Justin Walters, who, who gives me enough rope to hang myself, all right? So, so you know, pretty much any project that I am sort of feel like would actually benefit us I can go ahead with. Um, so an example of that is um, the hydrological modeling that I talked about yesterday to, to um, generate uh, depression areas and uh, flow flow paths. Um, it was like, yep, just go for it. Um, previously, that would have been sent out to a consultant. We would have spent tens of thousands of dollars on it. Uh, good, another good example is last week, uh, one of our planners came through, was really interested in knowing uh, the impervious surface areas for our residential zone. All right. And I said, oh yeah, I can do that. And I thought, shit, how am I gonna do that? Um, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> luckily we had some aerial photography and it had a near infrared band in it. I looked up some university papers, thanks university guys, um, and worked out that I could use the raster calculator uh, and a few other little bits and pieces to work out what was impervious surface area and then from that work out that we had around about 39% on average is the impervious surface area in the residential area. Simon? Hi. Yes. Thanks for your talk. Um, How did you find navigating any security concerns with, and I'm not saying they're founded, but that's, I know Wellington City have, that's a lot of their issue when people want to use QGIS or other open sources. They accept the big vendor security stack. Right, yep, no, that's cool. Um, so 
we work really closely with our IT infrastructure team. So we're, we're actually hosted uh, in-house. Um, they provide all the security mechanisms in the front, so via reverse proxies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Having said that, um, we're not immune to attack. We have been attacked. Um, fortunately, nothing dramatic. Um, it's interesting. Um, we've probably been attacked right now, but that's no. um, Anyway, um, we had a situation where I did one tweet that said, hey, there's a tweet here. I'm, I'm doing this GIS stack. It's wonderful. Yeah, and good old Paul Ramsey, he's a fantastic bloke. He's one of the, the head developers for uh, uh, Postgres. Uh, he, he retweeted it, and a bunch of other people retweeted it. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you could just start to see this big spike in sort of, sort of attempts at hacking our system. <laughs> so, you know, it's just this is the nature of the thing. Um, so, yeah, we, we work pretty hard at keeping our security you know, up to scratch. And it's not just for GIS, it's for everything else in council as well. All right, so... So it's not treated in isolation. Mm. Yes. Hi. Um, it looks very nice what you're doing, and, and at the same time, this thing of cost saving yep. is, is kind of killing me. <laughs> um, I think there's no such thing as a free beer. So yeah. how do you contribute back to the goals of that to maintain, develop, and yep. pay up? That's a great question, and that's one of the reasons why I said that's that's where we really are. We, we've been great takers. We haven't been great givers. Um, so one of the things we want to try and do is give back more to some of those communities. I've already started contributing little bits of code where I can, little bits of um, you know, maybe documentation updates, those sorts of things. I want to do more of that, definitely. Um, and even just coming to, you know, Groups like this and providing support, you know, being on the committee, helping out the conference is, is another way of giving back. Yeah. Um, I was just going to ask you about on the panel. Right, sorry. Yeah. Should we try the mic? Yeah. Try to use the mic. Oh, you can use the mic. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to ask you about innovation. You mentioned that, you know, it's about innovation from from a partner. Yeah, um, especially within the planning department, which is which is probably we, we have quite a good affinity within our planning department because Daryl and I actually pretty much work in the same room as those guys, so so they understand. Um, so out of that has come a couple of little projects, which otherwise probably wouldn't have happened. Like we've worked out um, what land in our residential zone within the uh, city is actually developable and which is not. And that's based on um, running a QGIS model, which has criteria to identify whether there's depression areas, uh, flood zones, um, whether the slope of the land is greater than 20% and a whole bunch of these things. And so we've got this lovely big QGIS model now that we can just run for them whenever they want it. Um, and they've got direct sort of information at their hands to say these areas are developable, uh, these ones aren't. <laughs> yeah. Thank you.